She moves into it. And there it goes. It's high enough. It's long enough. It's a beauty. It's straight between the posts. The score here now. Hello and welcome to That's the Way It Was, a program that looks back at the history of rugby league. In episode 22, Paris, France, April 1931, in an office at 24 Drouot Street in the Montmartre district, a group of men have gathered and are involved in passionate conversation. It's been an unusually warm spring in France, and Parisians are out in the cafes and bars listening to the songs of Lucien Boyer while discussing the politics of Pierre Laval and the fashions of Coco Chanel. But the men who have gathered at 24 Drouot Street, amongst them Jean Gallier and Victor Breyer, are not here to discuss politics, music or fashion. They're here to discuss a dream they have. 91 years later, the dream they spoke of that night, a Rugby League World Cup, is about to stage its 16th edition. To discuss the history of this tournament, we're going to speak to historian and author Tony Collins. Tony has written a number of books on the history of Rugby League. His latest book is called Rugby League, A People's History. He's also the host of the Rugby Reloaded podcast. So, Tony, Welcome to That's the Way It Was. Thanks for having me on, Rob. Uh, I'm really excited to be here and talk about all the history of the Rugby League World Cup. Yes, yes, and it's a long history, Tony. So, Tony, these uh, those early discussions about rugby, uh, rugby League World Cup, I mentioned 1931 in the introduction, but there were more discussions held by the Rugby League Council in uh, January 1935. Uh, do you think these discussions were a bit uh, optimistic at that point of time? Um, that's a really good question because obviously when we look back into the past, then in, you know, in 1934, 1935, um, mm. there was only one World Cup. The Football World Cup, the Soccer World Cup had only begun in 1930. So the yes. idea of having a World Cup was a completely new phenomenon. Uh, so in a lot of ways, um, the French Rugby League authorities, led by Jean Gallier, were way ahead of the game in terms of seeing how sports would develop globally. So, so in a sense, yeah, they're optimistic, but on on the other hand, they're also visionaries. All right. So, uh, things I suppose really started to happen when a, a fellow called Paul Barriere becomes the vice president of the French Rugby League in uh, September 1944. So, can you tell us who is Paul Barriere? Well, Paul Barrier is very interesting. Uh, at the time, in 1944, uh, he was a leader of uh, one of the French resistance groups in the south of mm-hmm. France. He uh, was actively involved in uh, fighting against the Nazis. Um, uh, his background goes even further back in rugby. He was the nephew of the, um, uh, if you like, the owner of the Kian Rugby Union team, who in the 1920s became notorious for paying their players. Um, including Jean Gallier and many other players who switched to rugby league in the 1930s. So Paul Barrier was a um, was a, a French resistance hero. He was steeped in the history of rugby, and he was also very young at the time. He was in his early 20s when he became the, the uh, uh, president of the French rugby league, uh-huh. and so he brought say um, not only that you know, deep traditions uh, that he got, all the the bravery and the authority yeah. that he'd won during the war, but he was also a you know a, a young man with lots of ideas who wanted to make his mark on the world. Okay, so well, in November nineteen fifty-two, uh, he uh, informed the uh, uh, International Board of Rugby League, as it was called back then, that, that France will provide. Uh, Twenty-five thousand pounds towards expenses for a World Cup, but uh, the Australians and the uh, New Zealanders, uh, well, they want more money. But uh, the first World Cup is actually begins in 1954. There are plans uh, to include uh, the United States and Wales, uh, but this doesn't eventuate. So the the first match in the first World Cup is October the 30th. And uh, France defeats uh, New Zealand by uh, 22 points to 13. So, Tony, was this first World Cup a success? Yeah. 
Um, undoubtedly, I mean, look at the crowds. Um, I think the average is something like twenty to thirty thousand. So there were big crowds. Um, um, the other thing to remember is that this had been a kind of a slow burn thing because Paul Barrier had originally come up with the idea of the World Cup or revived the idea of the World Cup as far back as 1947. Mm-hmm. So, and he had been, uh, he knew about the plans uh, that Jean Gallier uh, proposed in the mid 1930s. And there was even talk about having the World Cup in 1937 when the kangaroos came over, but for a whole variety of logistical and financial reasons, it didn't work. Mm-hmm. However, I think the the success of French rugby league in the late 1940s, early 1950s, you know, despite the fact that it had been banned uh, throughout the war by the, the Vichy collaborationist government in, in France, uh, gave French rugby league a tremendous authority within the sport. And of course, as Australians will remember, the 1951 French team came over and uh, mm-hmm. blew Australia apart and became known as one of the greatest teams of all time. So, Effectively, in many ways, the, the French were the unofficial world champions, so they they had that authority. The other thing that Barrier could do, because he was also a businessman, he was involved in the theatre world and, and uh, in the musical world, um, he was also able to raise funds. And one of the objections that there had been to a World Cup was how would it pay? Because the staple of... Um, International Rugby League, where the mm-hmm. tours, kangaroo tours, kiwi yes. tours, lions tours, because that's the way that you made money. You played, you know, 20, 25, 30 games on a tour, and that's that's how you paid for it and made profit. The idea of just having a tournament where international teams play, played each other once, um, nobody could see how that could make money, and you know, particularly given the fact, obviously, teams had to travel from one hemisphere yeah. to another. That was a uh, that was a big problem. So the fact that Barrier could could raise that tremendous amount of you know twenty five thousand uh, pounds, given the given the fact that France was still recovering from the yep. uh, effects of World War Two, um, was a tremendous boost. Um, yeah, you're right that America was was in the mix in 1953. The American All Stars, the famous American All Stars, had toured Australia. Yes. and um, made a tremendous impression for a whole variety of reasons, not all football related. Um, and they'd also, um, they were also on tour in France in um, in early 1954. Uh, so the Americans were, it could have been possible the Americans could have been, been invited. There, there are other countries too which could have been invited. Canada, where rugby league was still being played in the eastern maritime provinces around Nova uh-huh. Scotia. Also, um, you know, was somewhere where the game was being played at a reasonably high standard. Uh, and also the French had expanded rugby league into Yugoslavia. And so Yugos- the old Yugoslavia, um, Serbia, Croatia, yep. Bosnia-Herzegovina and Slovenia, all these countries that are now independent. Uh, Yugoslavia was also playing rugby league. So there are at least three other countries that had so- where the game was being played in some form or another that, uh, who could have been invited. Um, nobody seems to have paid any attention to Canada or Yugoslavia. And when it was raised that America should be invited to play in the tournament, the um, the Rugby Football League secretary in England, Bill Fallowfield, um, um, refused to allow them to take part because he said, well, we don't know what their standard is and their standard will be very low and that's not what we want in the competition. Uh, and essentially it remained a... Um, it, it was the, the, cup, the World Cup, the first World Cup was played with the... If you like the the, the four uh, the four key teams in international rugby league, the four first class nations, if you like, yes. uh, of Great Britain, France, Australia, New Zealand. So, so yeah, it was a success. But it could have probably been an even bigger success if there'd have been a little bit more visionary thinking uh, and the, the 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 if you like the minor nations that were then playing rugby league had been invited to it. Yeah, and the final itself was well probably a, a surprise result. Yeah, um, you've got to remember this. This took place in um, the tournament took place in November 1954. Great Britain had just returned from an Ashes tour down under in yes. September 1954. Um, they'd um, they'd been beaten by Australia, who then held the Ashes, uh, and so the um, and so they 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 came back. A lot of the um, the key players who had been on that tour um, declared themselves unavailable for the World Cup. Again, the other thing to bear in mind is that not everybody, and this seems very strange to us today, not everybody in rugby league was in favour of a World Cup, of playing a World Cup. 
they thought that the main business of the international game was to play was yeah. touring sites. And so even uh, people who are normally regarded as rugby league visionaries, such as the English commentator and journalist Eddie Waring, uh, was very opposed to the World Cup and said, well, why are we playing this? It's a waste of time. We need to focus on playing the Kiwis and the Kangaroos mm-hmm. and the French. So there was a kind of, um, uh, people kind of looked down their nose a little bit at the tournament. And I think that would have influenced some of the players who had come back from Australia and thought, well, I've been away from home for a long time. I've got a hard season ahead of me. Uh, and do I really want to go away for another uh, three weeks and, and play in France? Which is obviously to their detriment, as it turned out, that uh, an understrength Great Britain team pulled off a shock and beat the French uh, in Paris, uh, again, overturning the, um, um, yeah. the the international hierarchy in many ways, because, as I said, France at that point were probably seen as the best team in the world. The Australian team manager, Jack McMahon, uh, said, and I quote here, it was a, ter- a terrific gamble by the French, but it has been a great thing for our code. So... Tony, the next World Cup is played three years later in Australia, and uh, this World Cup uh, marks the 50th anniversary of uh, rugby league starting in Australia. Great Britain uh, go into this tournament as favourites, uh, but uh, what actually occurs in this tournament, 1957? Well, it doesn't go according to plan because I think most people thought that Great Britain mm. um, who just won the Ashes in 1956. Uh, were the favourites. Um, however, um, they their preparation wasn't great. There were tensions within the camp. Uh, Bill Fallowfield, the secretary of the RFL, who we just mentioned, was also the manager of the team, and he fell out with the great Welsh player, Lewis Jones. Um, and there are other underlying tensions as well. So it never really worked out. Uh, the French never really fired either. And Australia basically ran away with the competition. It was organised on a league basis with the four, you know, the big four. Yep. Um, Australia won all of their games. The other nations uh, each won a single game. And Australia were declared champions on the basis that they'd finished at the top of the league. So whilst it was great for Australia, in terms of uh, it being a, uh, a, a, you know, a competitive tournament and uh, being as good as the, the one that was held in France, yeah. um, it didn't really compare. The other thing to bear in mind is that the 1954 final only had, sorry, the 1954 tournament only had a final because Great Britain and France finished uh, jointly at the top of the table with yes. an equal number of points. And so the final was uh, was arranged to see who the champion would be. But at that point, the uh, you know, International Rugby League felt that the way the best way to organise a World Cup was to have a, a league te- a, a league system. Yes. The, whoever finished at the top of the league was the winner. So it kind of took a little bit of the steam out of the tournament because yes. you know Australia had clearly finished at the top of the league and uh, and that was it really. So by the time you get to the final round, there's not really much uh, much no. that's in contention. Well, there was no final yes in this tournament. Uh, Australia did play a, a rest of the world team. They defeated the rest yeah. of the world by twenty to eleven. And, well, the tournament that did make it, well, they, they record a profit there. Each team received uh, 8,852 pounds. So it did record a profit, even though, as you said, there, like the structure of the competition probably didn't add to the excitement. Uh, and after the tournament there, I, I, I did a note that, uh, well, France and Great Britain went off to South Africa after this tournament was played. And... Uh, they played three exhibition matches. That might become significant a bit later on. Now, in 1960, the tournament is held in Great Britain. Uh, BBC has live coverage of all the matches. Uh, but, Tony, again, the, probably the crucial game in this tournament takes place at uh, Odsall Stadium in Bradford there, October the 8th. Australia played Great Britain in one of the pool matches of this tournament. Yeah, Um Interestingly enough, they, even though, the, again, the tournament was organised on a league basis, the organisers um, realised enough that they um, organised it so that the last match mm-hmm. was between the two teams who were most likely to win, Great Britain and Australia. Mm-hmm. Um, which is, you think, if if they realised that, why, why didn't they organise a final? But anyway, that's, that's another matter. This yeah. is actually quite a successful tournament in terms of the crowds. Um, uh, oh, yeah, as you say, over 30,000 were at Odsall to see the, the, the last and deciding match of, of the tournament, which Great Britain won 10-3. Uh, 
it was broadcast live on BBC TV on a Saturday afternoon. But unfortunately, it wasn't a great game, uh, partly because it had been rain, typical English winter, it had been raining, so the pitch was very muddy. There were only two tries scored. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, as was often the case with Great Britain versus Australia encounters uh, at this time, um, the, the, the players often um, took their aggression a little too far and you know, three or four yes. fights broke out during the match. So it wasn't a very good spectacle, either in terms of the football played because of the conditions largely, but also in terms of the image that it gave it. Um, you know, the fights fights breaking out during the second half of the match on national TV aren't really the best advertisement for the yeah. uh, for the competition. So um it was viewed as a as a success for Great Britain because they obviously won and the crowds weren't too bad. Um but in terms of its impact on the game, uh, and certainly on the way that the game was perceived throughout the rest of Britain, um, it, it, it didn't do anything uh, to, to, to boost the profile or the image of the game. Yes. Uh, Great Britain finished on top of the table, so they were declared winners of the uh, tournament. And again, we had a match between Great Britain and the rest of the world, which uh, Great Britain won. Uh, they defeated the rest of the world by 33 to 27. Now, Tony, the next World Cup, uh, and again, uh, uh, I'm in sort of some doubts about this, but uh, there is talk that there is going to be another World Cup played in Australia and New Zealand in 1965. And there's even talk about South Africa uh, playing in this tournament. But uh, I don't know, the 1965 World Cup never happens, Tony. Uh, do, do you know what, what happened to this competition? Why was it cancelled? It well, it's it's all very vague. Um, yeah, there's one of the stories that that, that there is is that um, France toured Australia in 1964 and yes. were um, uh, were heavily defeated three 0 and it was a kind of you know disappointment after the success of the French teams in the early 1950s. But obviously, this is a different generation of players. Mm -hmm. um, that may or may not have had something to do with it. One of the things that was going on behind the scenes, however, was that the the, the Australian authorities and the British authorities were at loggerheads. Um, they had fallen out over the amount of money that was uh, divided between them on the um, 1962. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of the dates. Yeah, the 1962 Ashes series. Um, there had been a number of clashes over various administrative issues as well. So the traditional relationship between Britain and Australia was changing as well, and that was true, you know, in 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 life in general and in politics. Uh, you know, Australia was moving away from Britain. Britain was moving more towards yeah. Europe and the common market. So there were a lot of tensions. And on the nineteen sixty um, nineteen sixty two um, um, Lions tour, uh, there'd be a lot. There'd been a lot of falling outs between the the various officials on. Uh, on the British side who were leading the tour and also in Australia. So th I think ultimately what happened was that the um, the falling out and the bad relationship that had developed between the British and Australian authorities, which were effectively the, the rulers of the game, mm -hmm. meant that the nobody had any real appetite for a World Cup in 1965. And um, the, the poor performance of the French... Um, um, was used as an excuse. I mean, and it was an excuse because when Australia, when the when the Kangaroos visited France in 1967, um, France actually won the series. Uh -huh, so yeah. it's yeah. So it's it's. I think that's a bit of that. That's that's a bit of um, after the yeah. fact excuse making. I think mainly the I, I suspect what really happened is that the British and the Australians couldn't come to an agreement on the way the money would be divided. All right. All right. Well, okay. So uh, uh, the next World Cup is held in 1968 in Australia and New Zealand. And, uh, well, and the French end up making the final in this uh, tournament. Uh, so uh, uh, those uh, excuses given, uh, as you pointed out there previously, uh, didn't come to bear. Uh, but, uh, yes, France end up making the final. And, uh, again, there was a, well, a crucial game in this final. It actually took place in Carlow Park in Auckland between France and Great Britain, um, where, uh, well, France uh, defeated uh, a Great Britain team that, uh, well, you had uh, Tommy Bishop in there and Roger Millwood, uh, but uh, uh, the penalty count was heavily in Great Britain's favour. 
but uh, France ended up defeating Great Britain by seven points to two. There was a final, and uh, Australia uh, won the final fairly comfortably by 20 points to two. So, Tony, we go now, we see another change in the World Cup schedule because the next World Cup is held just two, two years later in Great Britain. Uh, um, and, Tony, the 1970s World Cup is probably, well, it's probably best remembered for two things. First, uh, first we see, uh, well, there was a massive decline in the attendance, attendances at uh, all the matches. But, two, it uh, did produce a final which has lived on in the memory of many rugby league uh, followers. Do you remember? What can you tell us about this final match? Uh, well, I, yeah, it's, sadly, I'm old enough to remember this match. I was, uh, <laughs> I would have been, I think, seven years old at the time. And uh, for me personally, it's, it's, it's seared into my memory because, um, you know, one of the things you, you learn as a, as a um, well, a supporter of any sport, uh, let alone rugby league, is to how to handle disappointment. And so going into the 1970 World Cup, um, Great Britain had come back from Australia, having won the Ashes, taken back mm -hmm. the Ashes, and this would be the last time we ever we ever won them, um, um, and had a great team, uh, as you say, people like Roger Millwood, uh, Malcolm Reilly, mm -hmm. Phil Lowe, uh, you know, many of these who went over to uh, play in Australia in the seventies, um, and it appeared. I mean, Great Britain had um, uh, Great Britain had defeated Australia in the in the group game again. This was just on to go back to the the um, the way the tournament was organised. This was another, this was a league system, but the top two played off in the final, just as they had yes. done in Australia in 1968. So um, Australia finished, Great Britain finished top. They'd won all their games in the group stages. Uh, Australia finished second by virtue of having a, a better points difference over yes. France and uh, and New Zealand. So it was Great Britain and Australia in the final. And I, as a young seven-year-old, fully expected. Um, uh, Great Britain to win the World Cup um, uh, in in Leeds, uh, which is where I'm speaking to you from. Um, but no, they didn't. Uh, it was um, uh, that they, they had a few injuries, but it was one of these games where um, the British team never really got beyond first gear, and Australia just squeezed the life out of them. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks to the great Eric Sims kicking goals, including the yes. drop goal, um, and a couple of tries to um, uh, John Coutts and Lionel Williamson. Um, however, um, that's so it was remembered with acute disappointment by me, and I would imagine thousands of other rugby league fans. Uh, however, the um, overwhelming impression that was left by the game was of violence. Um, yeah. It had become a people. I think many of the players were settling scores that had been started in, during the Ashes series. And fights broke out, uh, certainly throughout the second half. And fights continued after the final whistle had been blown. Um, and some of the fights took place. Between, I mean, for example, John Atkinson was involved in a fight. And I think that was probably the only um, time that the Leeds and Great Britain winger had ever been involved in a fight in a match mm -hmm. in his entire career. Um, and this left an, a really bad taste in the mouth. Uh, again, it was on national TV. And uh, the the only thing that the media reported in the newspapers and in TV reports was the violence of the game. And it was so bad that one uh, local councillor in Leeds um, demanded that the game should be stopped from being played in schools in Leeds because it was so violent. Mm -hmm. And what made this even worse was this, this uh, the, t the teacher who uh, demanded this was also a, a director of Bramley Rugby League Club. Right. So he had been so appalled by his own game, he wanted to stop it being played. Uh, uh, and that was Ronnie Teeman, who's still alive today. Uh, and Ooh, who right. regrets having said that in the first place. But um, so, yeah, um, what really was quite a good tournament until the final was really um, uh, besmirched by the, the violence that took place in the second half and after the, the yeah. match had uh, after so the Tony match finished. Tony, I actually, sorry, I said there that this World Cup would be remembered for two things, but I should have said it would be actually be remembered for three things because uh, after they won the World Cup, uh, uh, Australia returned to the uh, where they were staying, their headquarters there at the Midland Hotel where they were staying, and uh, apparently they put the trophy up for display in the uh, foyer there of the uh, hotel, but uh, then, well, <laughs> Tony, what happened to the... Uh, uh, a rugby league world cup trophy 
Well, it's actually even more mysterious than that, as I have discovered fairly recently, because uh-huh. um, originally it was thought that the trophy had been stolen um, when the Australians returned to the hotel in Bradford after winning. Yeah. But in fact, it's more complicated because there was a, th- this was the first World Cup that was sponsored. So the sponsors provided a trophy. The original World Cup trophy was held by Australia and they had brought it with them and they kept it at the hotel in Bradford. And it was actually stolen in the week before the World Cup final. Ah, uh-huh. um, so, you know, we're still discovering things about the, the 1970 World Cup. And it just disappeared. Nobody knew what had happened to it, when it had been stolen uh, or anything. It was assumed that, uh, as was often the case with trophies in those days, and probably still is, there'd been some you know, shenanigans with the trophy. And it had been, uh, um, you know, players had had perhaps one too many yes. drinks in the Midland Hotel bar and that somebody had forgotten about it and somebody had uh, seen it as an opportunity to take it. And so it disappeared. And it wasn't discovered for for almost another twenty years. It's it's important to say here as well that this was you know England had a pretty bad record on when it came to losing World Cup trophies because in 1966 the England soccer team had also yeah. lost the Jules Rime trophy which had been discovered um, uh, only a couple a few weeks later. Um, but so rugby league was following in, in an honourable yeah. English tradition of by losing the World Cup. Uh, and, but as I say, it wasn't until um, uh, I think 1989, when the trophy was rediscovered in a ditch um, in Bilden, which is a small town just outside of Bradford, um, much the worse for wear. But it's uh, uh, one of the great things about the current this World Cup that's going to kick off uh, on Saturday yeah. is that they've restored that original World Cup trophy, uh, okay. uh, placed a cockerel back on top, which had been lost sometime in the 1960s. So um, yeah, the, the the story has come full circle. All right, so Tony, the, uh, there's another two-year gap to the uh, 1972 World Cup, which is played in France. Uh, unfortunately, again, uh, this tournament uh, is characterised by very poor attendances. But again, we have a very uh, memorable final, Tony, uh, the 1972 World Cup final. Uh, do you want to tell us what happened in this game? Well, yeah, it's a... Um... Uh, it's a memorable final. It's also a memorable tournament, to be honest. There was some good football played, and there was mm-hmm. also a um, earlier in the tournament during the league stage, um, um, Great Britain and Australia had played a fantastic match, which I think is on YouTube if anybody cares to look. Yes. Uh, the, the British had won 27 21. So there was, you know, so they played this, there's been some fantastic football played, despite the fact, as you say, that the crowds were abysmal. French mm-hmm. rugby league was um, at a very low ebb at that point. Uh, had been almost entirely marginalised by the French media, yep. um, uh, and had continued to diso- um, to uh, to suffer from discrimination from French rugby union, yep. and couldn't even be called rugby at this time. Um, rugby league was still called jeu à trois, which yep. means game of thirteen. So, so French rugby league was struggling in a, in a big way. Um, however, Great Britain and Australia again finished first and second in the in the league table. And they played in the final at, uh, at Lyon, which was a, uh, a remarkably tense and dramatic occasion. And again, uh, sadly, I'm old enough to remember watching this live. So I remember Clive Sullivan picking up the loose ball and racing yes. away to score the, tr- uh, score the um, uh, length of the field try. Uh, Mike Stevenson, the um, Penrith uh, yes. hooker, uh, who later became... A TV uh, pundit, uh, both in uh, I think on the ABC in Australia and Sky mm-hmm. Sports here, scored the other try. Um, but the game ended ten all, um, and it was decided on the basis that the um, that Britain had won the first game. Um, however, uh, any Australians listening to this will also remember the fact that Graham Langlands had a try disallowed for mm-hmm. offside when he followed up a kick, I think, from Tim Pickup. Um, no, I don't think yes. pick, maybe uh, no, I don't think Pickup was playing. Maybe it was uh, maybe it's from Fulton. But um, yeah, Graham Lang- uh, Langland's in typical Ward, style. Yeah. Dennis yeah. Ward, yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, yeah, scrum half. Um, Langland's ran through, caught the ball in the full, went over the line. Fantastic try, and the um, the referee, um, uh, Monsieur Jamo, um, basically he couldn't believe Langland's had got to the ball in time and so awarded the penalties for Great Britain to Great yes. Britain for offside. 
which would have changed the complexion of the match and the tournament. But as it turned out, um, they finished full, uh, finished 80 minutes on at 10 all. Then they played extra time. No further scoring uh, yes. took place. And so Clive Sullivan, uh, who was the, the first uh, black player ever to captain the Great Britain side in any sport, uh, lifted the trophy. And sad to say, uh, as someone from England, that was the last time that the, the, the British won the trophy. Yes, yes. They said it was the greatest try never scored. Uh, that's how yeah. they described it. But uh, to tell you the truth, when I saw this, it was actually, uh, well, for me personally, uh, uh, Tony, this uh, did bring back uh, memories uh, uh, when this try was scored because in, uh, well, in 1971, St George uh, played Manly Warringah uh, in a uh, preliminary final here. Uh, and uh, Manly were very heavy favourites uh, uh, to win this game. But uh, uh, you'll find that, uh, well, if you can get any vision of that game, I don't know if there is any vision anymore of this match, but you'll find that in that match, uh, um, it was Billy Smith. Now, Billy Smith didn't play in the 72 World Cup because I think he was injured. But uh, Billy Smith put up uh, two very similar kicks to Dennis Ward. And uh, you saw uh, Graham Langlands flying through the air to score two tries. And St George did upset uh, Manly in that preliminary final. But, but uh, this try that was scored in the uh, 72 World Cup was very similar to what had happened a year earlier in the preliminary final in uh, here in Sydney. Uh, so it did uh, bring back memories for me. Uh, three years later, we see... Now, three years later, we see a complete change in the structure of the World Cup. But because... Well, we now have what... It's called the Rugby League World Championship. So can you explain, well, how, how this tournament was run, Tony? Well, <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure I can because it got incredibly complicated. I think one of the things that had happened is that um, the rugby league authorities realised that just having four teams um, wasn't enough teams, and there was you know sufficient talent mm -hmm. um, in in Wales or yes. Welsh players in the game that they could have they could separate Great Britain to England and Wales to make the tournament slightly bigger, and also in terms of the the length of the tournament. Um, I think one of the things that was happening in the 1970s was that the, the rugby league was becoming more aware of the importance of TV and the money that TV could bring into the game. So the idea that you would have a uh, you could have a World Cup that was spread over uh, a number of different cities in all the heartlands of, of rugby league mm -hmm. um, in um, Australia, New Zealand, France, and England and Wales uh, mm -hmm. was very attractive. Um, whether the way in which it was organised was the best way, the optimum way, is another matter because it kind of became very, um, it seems gone for a long time. People yes. lost track of what was going on. And it was just too, uh, it was strange really because it went from, the tournament went from just having four teams and it was over in a matter of two weeks or three weeks to having the five teams, but it was played over, I think it's. I think first start. The first match was played in March of 1975, and the um, uh, the last match was sometime in October. No, um, yes. November 1975. Yes, um, so it was sort of a, a. Well, it seemed to be part of the tournament was played in Australia and New Zealand, and then the next part of the tournament was played over in uh, uh, the UK. So it was sort of a tournament divided into two by the by the look of it. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it's difficult to you know. It, uh, it, you know, playing a playing a World Cup over that length of time and over such a great geographical distance, it's hard for fans to engage with it, and certainly it's hard yes. for any neutrals or you know, uh, non-rugby yeah. fans to engage with it. So, I mean, again, there was some good football play. Wales had a very good very good team at this time as well. Yes. So, people like David Watkins, Clive Sullivan was playing for Wales, Bill Francis in the backs, then people mm -hmm. like Jim Mills. Um, Colin Dixon in the forwards. I mean, th this was a pretty useful team. Um, but nevertheless, the, the, the tell you the truth, uh, well, Tony, the that uh, that uh, the, the the really the crucial game in this tournament, uh, because Australia finished on top of the table at the end of the uh, uh, let's say the pool matches. Australia was on top of the table with thirteen points, and England was second with twelve points, but. Really, the crucial match, and for some reason this match was played in Brisbane, 
but uh, Wales did beat England uh, in this uh, World Cup. Uh, uh, world Championship fixture by 12 to 7 up there in Brisbane. And uh, as you said, the Welsh did have a very good uh, team at that time. Um, uh, there was sort of like uh, Australia were declared winners. There was sort of like, because Australia, well, Australia actually hadn't beaten England during the tournament. They There was a draw in uh, Sydney, a 10 all draw, and then uh, England won the return fixture. Uh, so there was sort of this final challenge match was held, uh, which Australia did win quite easily. They won by 25 to nil. But uh, yes, that crucial match in that tournament turned out to be that Welsh victory over England up in Brisbane. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, the, the, the entire tournament sounded that. Otherwise, if England had won, then they would yes. have finished top. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And things would have been different. So uh, th I think that concentrated people's minds on having, certainly in, in Britain anyway, on whether it was a good idea to have separate Eng England yes, and Wales yes. teams. Well, well, this is this is what happens because two years later, okay, the the Rugby League World Championship, well, it's completely abandoned, and we go back to what I suppose you might call a more traditional format for the 1977 World Cup, which is held in Australia. And now the Sydney Morning Journalist, uh, Sydney Morning Herald journalist there, Alan Clarkson, described it as a fairly lax luxury, uh, lack luxury tournament. Again, the crowd, again the crowds were not great, but uh, again, Tony, we had a very good final uh, of this tournament between Australia and Great Britain, and uh, um, yes, uh, uh, Great Britain are back in the tournament. Sorry, Great Britain are back in the tournament because uh, yes. Wales are not included in this tournament, but it was probably in the final, Tony. Again, this was a match that the British probably thought, uh, well, this is one that they should have won. Uh, this is one that would uh, uh, they let get away. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it finished, what, I think 13-12. Um, mm -hmm. And it was it was nip and took all. I think Australia scored three tries to two or something like that. So kind of on balance, um, they were deserved winners. The... One of the things that's very interesting, and I think it's often mm -hmm. forgot about when we look at the 1970s, is that at this point in 1977, um, British players who were playing for Sydney clubs, of which there were a lot at this time, mm -hmm. uh, so you know, um, Malcolm yeah. Reilly being the most notable, uh, Phil Lowe, Brian Lockwood, uh, you know, many of the sort of classic mm -hmm. ball-playing British uh, forwards were playing in Sydney and weren't allowed to play for Great Britain. So yes. that the Great Britain side that played in that tournament would have looked very different if there hadn't have been a ban on uh, overseas-based British players playing for the national team. So that, that you know, really that that Great Britain team that played in that tournament was uh, kind of well, not a second team, but certainly what was nowhere near a full-strength Great Britain team. So yes. again, things could have been very different if just you well, know, a couple of circumstances would have changed. Yes, well, uh, George Fairburn, the uh, English, uh, the British fullback there, he missed, uh, well, early in the game, he missed a fairly simple shot at penalty there early in the match. There was a very strange decision. I did watch this game. I did, uh, as you said, many of these games are on YouTube, and I did sort of watch a replay of this. There was a very strange decision here he, during, just before half time of this game, where uh, Stuart Wright, the English winger, took an intercept and, uh, well, he was off to score a try. But the uh, uh, referee, the referee was actually English. He stopped play, called it back and uh, gave a penalty to England, uh, uh, to uh, Britain. Uh, so that was sort of a strange decision there. Again, that was something that uh, 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 went against the British during the course of this game. The British had a whole heap of possession as well. The, the final scrum count was um, it was 16 to 7 in favour of Great Britain. Uh, uh, so they had heaps of ball. Roger Millwood was by far the standout player during the course of this game. Um, so, uh, um, but it did, uh, uh, as I said, they had heaps of possession. The English, the British hooker was a, a fellow from uh, Widnes called uh, Keith Yule. Elwell, Keith Elwell, yeah. Elwell, Keith Elwell, yes. And again, this did sort of watching this match, it sort of jogged my memory because I I did remember seeing a Challenge Cup final uh, that Keith Yule, uh, Elwell played in. He was involved in, I can't remember what year it was, he was playing for Witness. Uh, uh, it was a, a 
Challenge Cup that finished in, uh, well, it actually ended in a draw um, against, uh, I think it was Hull there. Yeah. But I remember, yes, I remember Keith Hell from uh, uh, when I saw the replay of this uh, World Cup final, I sort of said, oh, hold on, this uh, is this fellow that played in that um, Challenge Cup final. Because in that Challenge Cup final, he was, well, he was all over the place uh, there. He was in, involved in everything. He kicked a field goal that, uh, uh, well, as I said, the match ended, I think it was 12 all. I can't exactly remember. Um, he was a, he was a different sort of hooker because he was a small nuggety type of player. He was more like a halfback, but uh, it did just jog my memory when I was watching this final. He had a very good game, but as I said, the standout player of the final was Roger Millwood, who was a British captain at the moment. Um, but Australia uh, win the 1977 World Cup by defeating Great Britain by 13 to 12. Now, Tony, we have to wait eight years before the next World Cup in 1985, or I should say the World Cup begins in 1985, because, Tony, there is another very big change to the World Cup format. I mean, again, do you do you understand what uh, happened here with this uh, new format? Um, yeah, it was... Uh, one of the things that's kind of puzzling, I think, is why... But, you know, you get to the 1980s and you think, why isn't there a regular Rugby League World Cup? It's a bit puzzling. And I think it's yes. kind of often you find that um, sports administrators are still stuck slightly in the past. And so they they still operate on the basis of things how they used to be. And that was tours still. And so, the, you know, in terms of making money out of a Rugby League World Cup, uh, I, uh, I think they had felt that the 70... The old type of format hadn't worked. The four teams mm -hmm. classic tournament uh, hadn't worked. The new types of tournament hadn't really worked. And so the whole thing was put on hold. And they came up with the idea. And there was, there was a lot of pressure. And also, remember, at this time, um, Rugby Union was beginning to discuss having a World Cup. And they eventually mm -hmm. did start their World Cup in 1987. So I think we were looking over our shoulders a bit about uh, what Rugby Union was doing. And so the idea was that uh, to make the third test of each three yes. match series, a World Cup match, so that, you know, it, it, it wouldn't be a dead rubber. So even if one team had won the, the previous two matches, there was still something to play for in the um, in the third match. And so you get this format whereby the third match in every, um, in every series yes. uh, becomes a World Cup match, which does add interest to it, but it means that it... It's not really a World Cup tournament that anybody can, you know, can can grasp easily. It's just something that that happens until you get to the final. Yes, I know. Uh, uh, Papua New Guinea are admitted into the competition, but the other thing that I noticed there that France actually forfeited some of the matches that, that they were due to play during uh, uh, this yeah. uh, tournament. So uh, there were some big scores against Papua New Guinea during the course of the tournament. The tournament was held over a three-year period, but uh, Papua New Guinea did have they did have a very big win against New Zealand uh, in 1986. Then New Zealand uh, had toured Australia and Papua New Guinea, and uh, uh, in the second test of the uh, uh, of the Papua New Guinea leg of the tour, well, Papua New Guinea defeated New Zealand by 24 points to 22 in Port Moresby, so they proved their worth. The Final was between Australia and New Zealand. New Zealand made the final. Uh, Australia finished on 12 points. New Zealand 11. Great Britain 10. Um, so New Zealand qualified for the final, basically because they won the third test. Uh, there was a third test played early in '89 in Christchurch, and New Zealand defeated Great Britain by 12 points to 10 in that test match. But the final itself was a pretty disappointing game with the. Uh, you know, Australia led 21 to nil at half time. They ended up winning 25 12, but it was a match of a very uh, a good looking uh, New Zealand team, but they seemed to be uh, uh, more interested in uh, sort of fighting than playing football. Uh, so Australia wins the 1989 World Cup. Now, Tony, during the course of this tournament, something else happens here. Um, in 1985, the international board is having a uh, uh, a meeting, uh, and the French chairman at the time is uh, Jacques Sapelsa. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, yeah. Jacques Sapelsa. 
Jacques can't speak English, so he needs an interpreter. The interpreter they find is actually an Australian rugby league player who's playing for uh, Paris Chatillon in the off season over there. His name is Taz Bayatiri. And Taz, Tony, can you tell us what about uh, what role does Taz Bayatiri uh, play in the future of international rugby league? All oh, right, uh, Taz is um, uh, Taz is a hero of international rugby league, as I'm sure anybody who knows him will, mm-hmm. will tell you. Uh, he he kind of um, um, I can't remember what his exact title was, but he basically played the role of international development officer. And mm-hmm. um, uh, you know he had a European background, but was born and raised in, in Australia, but could yes. you know um, could speak French and I think Italian. Um, um, and so Taz was. I, he also you know, has a great sort of dynamic personality. So if Taz wants to do mm. something, he would set out and do it. Um, and so he was very involved, partly in reviving French rugby league, uh, tried to get the uh, the game started in Italy, and uh, and then went to to work in the Pacific Islands uh, to promote the game. So in a lot mm-hmm. of ways, Taz was playing a central role in in the. Um, uh, reviving international rugby league and particularly reviving the World Cup just through the work that he was doing on the ground in getting the game started or getting people uh, re-enthused about the game. And I think if you look at anything about the international game and how it was being developed in the 1980s and 1990s, you'll find Taz's name is there, whether it's in the Northern Hemisphere or the Southern Hemisphere. Yes, so he plays a crucial role. The The next World Cup is held between uh, 1989 and 1992, and it's a similar sort of home and away base uh, format as the previous World Cup. Australia finished on top of the table. Uh, in fact, Australia were undefeated. They uh, played eight matches and uh, for 16 points. Both Great Britain and New Zealand uh, uh, finished on 10 points. But uh, Great Britain qualify for the final because uh, they have a superior for and against uh, record there. Great Britain had some big wins during the course of this tournament. Uh, big win over France, uh, 45 to 10. Big win over Papua New Guinea, 56 to 4. Now, the final is supposed to be played in Australia, but the Australians give up the right to host the final. And they agree. Uh, they agree to stage the match at uh, Wembley Stadium in London. And Tony, this is a decision. Well, it's a decision that almost they they almost live to regret because uh, it was again a very memorable final. This one in 1992. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I was actually at this game as well. The um, mm. uh, this was a time when when Great Britain were were pushing Australia very hard. Uh, mm-hmm. And there were some great, great players in the Great Britain team. Uh, Ellery Hanley, most notably. Mm-hmm. Um, Gary Schofield, Martin mm-hmm. Fire, uh, Kevin Ward. Um, I mean, the, the Great Britain in the early 1990s had, had some great, great players. And uh, they, they pushed Australia all the way um, in the, uh, the 19, well, 1992 and 1994 mm-hmm. Ashes, and 1990 Ashes series. And so this, in a sense, was a continue. This match was a continuation of those Ashes battles. And it was as tight as a drum all the way through. Both teams were pretty evenly matched. And it mm-hmm. was only um, uh, a, a slip by the English winger um, that had well, been brought on as a substitute, uh, John, uh, John Devereux, who allowed Steve Renoff yes. uh, to score you know, a, a classic, elegant Steve Renoff try, uh, which gave Australia a 10 6 lead and which they, they never relinquished. Great Britain came close. Um, uh, it was a tremendously exciting and tense match, despite the fact it was low scoring. But also, it was a fantastic crowd. Seven, yes. Over 73,000 people were there. And it made its mark not just on the north of England, where obviously rugby league has always been mm-hmm. strong, but also uh, nationally as well. And uh, you know, as, as I say, I was at that match, and a lot of people who went to that game were obviously not from the north of England and had been drawn by the fact that he was a... You know, uh, potentially a really successful Great Britain team against a very, very, very good Australian team that were probably, you know, the, the best, uh, one of the best sports teams of any code uh, in the world at the time. So it was really a, it could have been a pivotal moment for rugby league. Yes. Um, because of the closeness of the score, the, the strength of the two teams, and the profile that the World Cup final got in Britain was, uh, was way beyond anything that had been experienced before. Um, but 
you know, as we all know, in the mid 1990s, rugby league changed very radically. Yes. Uh, and both sides, uh, you know, both hemispheres, and uh, I think that opportunity was lost. Yeah. Well, this is it because the next World Cup is held in Britain in 1995. We go back to a, a singular tournament now. And as you said there, it's a World Cup. But, well, you might say there's a dark cloud rising uh, from the desert floor here because the Super League war is uh, looming. Or, well, in fact, uh, the Super League war has already really commenced when this tournament is played. Uh, but, Tony, it's also, you know, some people might say this is the beginning or the start of uh, what we might term the modern Rugby League World Cup because... Uh, there is another change to the structure of the competition. Uh, we no longer have we no longer have just uh, one group. Uh, there are now three groups, uh, Tony, and uh, there's a lot of new teams becoming involved. A lot of uh, uh, countries like Fiji, South Africa, Tonga, um, and West Samoa all make their World Cup debut. debut. So, Tony, do you uh, what do you just want to? Tell us what happened in the 1995 World Cup. Well, as you said, I think this was the first, if you like, modern World Cup. It was organised, mm. uh, you know, in groups, uh, in the way that, you know, um, that people expect World Cups to be organised. That There are groups and uh, the top teams in the groups progress to the knockout stages. Mm. So it was a, uh, a huge relief to finally see a World Cup organised as a World Cup. And... Uh, Again, I mean the the interest that this generated amongst uh, the public across Britain um, was higher than anything that had ever been seen for any other World Cup tournament. So uh, in Wales, I mean Wales played what was then called Western Samoa in mm -hmm. Swansea, yes. and this was a a game that echoes down the ages in terms of its intensity, uh, the the way the crowd got behind the Welsh team, and it was really a um, you know for the first time. The Welsh National Rugby League team actually became an important factor in Welsh sport. Uh -huh. And one indication of that was when um, uh, England played Wales in the World Cup semi final at Old Trafford. Um, there, uh, I've never seen so many Welsh people at a rugby league match. And many of them were, you know, uh, talking to some of them, they identified as, you know, they're rugby union sports, but they're supporting their national team. Yes. And it was a great Welsh team with people like um, uh, Jonathan Davis mm -hmm. in it who'd come over from uh, from rugby union. Rugby, yes. So the tournament, worked, the tournament was very successful uh, as a tournament. Um, it was undermined somewhat by mm -hmm. the fact that the Super League war, as you mentioned, had broken out in Australia. And only the uh, ARL aligned players were selected for the mm -hmm. Australian team. None of the, no, nobody who signed for Super League could be selected, which obviously gave England fans some hope that yes, uh, you know some of the best, some of Australia's best players weren't in the tournament, so maybe England could do it. But yet again at Wembley, England versus Australia, very very close game, but Australia came out on top. Um, but I think anybody who remembers that tournament will think of it as being the you know the start of the modern yes. World Cup. The other thing to to mention about this was that in terms of there was some vision that was taking place. There was also an Emerging Nations yes. Cup that took place with some of the smaller nations like uh, I think USA, uh, um, um, uh, Georgia, who no longer play sadly, uh, taken over by rugby union, uh, who were being encouraged to play international rugby league and were were. were uh, uh, had experience of playing internationally. And as you say, in the main tournament, it was the first time that Fiji, uh, Samoa and Tonga mm -hmm. had, um, had taken yes. part in a, in a World Cup, which obviously, as we as yeah. we know today, was the the seeds of um, uh, what's going to happen over the next four weeks. Yes, I know. And, and in that Emerging Nations uh, World Cup, their uh, Cook Islands actually won the final. Yes, yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, I'd forgotten, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they defeated Ireland by 22 points to six in that uh, competition. Five years later, in the year 2000, we have the 12th Rugby League World Cup. Now, I did find some media reporting that says that this tournament uh, was put forward by one year. Well, it was supposed to be held in 1999, but it was apparently put forward so that it wouldn't clash or coincide with the 1999 Rugby Union World Cup. There's also a change to, in the format because in the year 2000, we now have four groups. We have four groups of four teams. 
uh, and a number a number of countries uh, make their World Cup debut in this tournament. The Cook Islands come in, Russia, Ireland, Scotland. Uh, they even have the New Zealand Maoris team uh, were included in this competition. Um, uh, but Tony it was a competition. It was a tournament that was dominated by large score lines. There was a lot of large score lines in this uh, um, uh, uh, tournament. I mean, the semi-finals there at New Zealand by 49 to 6 over England and Australia defeated Wales 46-22 uh, in the other final, in, in the other semi-final. The final itself, well, Australia did eventually win quite comfortably, 40 to 12, although it was fairly close, uh, you know, uh, 10, 15 minutes to go there. But Australia did win it comfortably, comfortably. But Tony, the other big plus to come out of the 2000 World Cup is that we also see the start of a women's rugby league World Cup. Uh, this was the first year that it was held. And, uh, uh, well, this turns out to be a big plus for the game of uh, rugby league, Tony. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of the things that, um, you know, we, we, we tend to, you know, obviously because women's rugby league um, is becoming increasingly more and more successful, both in the, uh, in the Southern Hemisphere and the Northern Hemisphere. And I think we're going to mm -hmm. see that in the, the Women's World Cup here. But it's really those pioneers in 2000, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Great Britain really set the the ball in motion, and there was there were some great games. Um, yeah. You know, Great Britain. I think Great Britain defeated Australia in that. Um, yes. Uh, uh, in in that tournament as well. So that it, that um, sort of ignited the um, the rivalry that you get in the men's game in the women's game, and um, uh, and many of those those players um, and officials who organised it have been honoured at the moment um, in rugby league ah. uh, through the uh, in the um, inauguration of a women's rugby league hall of fame, which three of the players, British players who played in that tournament, have been inducted. So yeah, so out of little acorns, uh, large oak trees grow. So yes. that was one. In a, and when we look back, that was probably one of the more positive things to come out of that. Uh, although it was organised separately from the Men World Cup. It was yes. probably one of the more more positive things to come out because the the men's tournament in two thousand really didn't. Um, it suffered. There was very bad weather. It was, um, you probably the Australian uh, mm -hmm. listeners are thinking, well, it's always bad weather in Britain, but this was an exceptionally bad winter. Um, and as far as I can remember, every game I went to see, it was um, it was pouring down with rain. Um, so it wasn't much of a spectacle. The other problem, which mm -hmm. I think you alluded to in the the high scores, is that the game. After this, it was, it was just after the end of the Super League War, and mm -hmm. the game didn't quite seem, uh, if you like, at ease with itself. Um, the the British game was in turmoil for a whole variety of reasons, partly due to the Super League War, partly due to internal problems, um, and there was really there were no no significant challenges to Australia. Mm -hmm. no, what? And I think it must be borne in mind they they also had a great great team in that final in in that series. Um, yes. Um, yes. So yeah, it wasn't it. It sadly, leaving aside the the first women's World Cup, it wasn't really a memorable tournament. I don't think. Um, no. I think from a British perspective, well, from a Northern Hemisphere perspective, rather the the one good thing was the performance of Ireland, who, uh, who put up yeah. a pretty good show in group stages. But, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and New Zealand won that first the first women's World Cup. I just sort of I'll throw that in. Yeah, but New Zealand uh, they defeated Great Britain in the final by twenty six points to four. So we move forward eight years to two thousand and eight. Uh, the world a World Cup that was supposed to be held in two thousand and four is played in two thousand and eight. And again, Tony, from what I can gather from press reports, this competition was delayed so that it would coincide with the centenary of rugby league here in Australia. Um, we see another change in the format of the tournament. We have uh, three groups of differing numbers. Um, in fact, after the draw was announced, Papua New Guinea um, threatened to walk out of this competition because they were drawn in uh, Group A with uh, Australia, New Zealand and Great Britain. But uh, I think uh, Tony, it's uh, it's best remembered because this tournament was a financial success. That very large uh, 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 TV audiences, worldwide TV audiences, 
But Tony, I think it will also be remembered because, uh, well, we have a new winner of the World Cup in 2008. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, this is, as you say, the PNG objected because one of the problems that um, the, the group um, style tournament created mm -hmm. was the, um, uh, it, it meant that the, 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 the final um, knockout teams, the, fact, the teams that went through to the final knockout stages, sorry, uh, were, would have been unpredictable. So certainly in 1995 and uh, um, uh, 2008, there was a the groups were manipulated. So, so um, the the top three, you know, the big three, Australia, New Zealand, and yes. England in this case, uh, could all progress to the um, uh, to the uh, to the group stage. stage. So yes. yeah, so the so PNG drew, you know were very unlucky that they were drawn yes. in Group A with Australia, New Zealand, and England, which meant that. You know, um, there was no way they could qualify for the knockout stages, despite the fact they were one. You know, they would have probably been you know ranked um, probably fifth or sixth in the world at that time. Yes. Um, so they, if they'd been in any other group, they would have had a great opportunity to go to go through to the knockout stages. And so this this presented this presented problems, and I you know, I think it went, led to a rethink later on as well. Well, it was a very convoluted. Yeah, it was a very yeah, convoluted. Yeah. I mean, you could look at the draw, and you could sort of burst, virtually predict well who's going to make the quarterfinals and the semifinals simply by the way they'd uh, set up the the structure of the competition. You know, yeah. they, uh, it was sort of a bit too convoluted. You know, World Cups, well, World Cups in any sport are sort of like, you know, uh, sort of like uh, what. I think what makes World Cups in any sport is the, the surprise result. You know, you get the surprise results, but it seemed as though they didn't want any surprise results. They wanted uh, certain teams to get through to uh, um, uh, to the uh, final stages of the competition. But uh, um, yes, as I said, New Zealand uh, go on to win this tournament. Uh, um, they defeated Australia in the final by 34 points to 20 um, in a very memorable match. I remember uh, I was there watching this game. I sort of thought that just, at halftime Australia led and I sort of thought uh, Australia would probably go on with it in the second half, but no, that didn't happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, Benji Marshall scored a, a, a try there um, and then there was a penalty try awarded uh, to Lance uh, Ohio uh, with about 10 minutes to go, and that gave New Zealand an eight-point lead. So at, uh, uh, they were 20 to one outsiders with the uh, booking agencies here. But uh, um, and New Zealand went on to do the double because they defeated Australia in the Women's World Cup as well. So uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So the other yeah, thing no, I, I think that that was probably the greatest final of all. I think because it was unexpected. It was a great game. And as you say, it was a new winner on the on the mm -hmm. for the tournament. So yeah, and I think anybody who saw it, you know, I, I watched it on TV. Mm -hmm. um, just a fan, just a fantastic game. Uh, I, you know, I would willingly re rewatch that game again. Yes, yes. Now the other thing I should mention as well in the lead up to this tournament, uh, we have sort of we start to see qualifying tournaments. Tony, we start to see qualifying tournaments. Uh, the international board starts to have. Uh, qualifying tournaments for the World Cup. You know, you have a European qualifying tournament. Uh, there's an American uh, qualifying, or they call it the Pacific qualifying tournament. Um, but so we start to see qualifying tournaments to actually get in the World Cup. And for instance, in this, quali in, this uh, in the lead up to this World Cup, uh, Wales actually did not qualify for um, the 2008 World Cup because they were beaten by Scotland. The Bravehearts... Uh, uh, beat them, uh, and uh, so Wales did not qualify for the World Cup, and Scotland did because they went through. They started to have qualifiers to uh, get into the main competition. The yeah, next... and also that I think the, the problem. Sorry, to, just interrupt. Yeah. I think, and also that led to what was really, um, uh, and I think somebody should have thought about this. Lebanon didn't qualify because they were beat. They they got to the final of the qualifying round and were beaten. I think by Samoa. 
Mm-hmm. So, you know, so Sydney missed out on the chance to have the Lebanon yeah. team playing in Sydney during the World Cup, which I think was a, yes. a massive marketing mistake. Yes, OK, yeah. The next uh, the next Rugby League uh, uh, Cup is held in 2013. Again, there is a five-year gap between tournament. Uh, this tournament, uh, this World Cup was supposed to be held in uh, 2012, but the Olympic Games are being held uh, in London in 2012. Uh, and this tournament is being staged in, well, it's staged in England and uh, Wales, France and Ireland. There were matches in Ireland. Um, so, Tony, we mentioned earlier that the 2008 World Cup uh, was a great success. But the 2013 uh, tournament was described as, well, it's been described as, well, the most successful successful World Cup to date. Uh, why do you receive, think it received these uh, reviews, mate? Uh, oh, well, I think but because the actual, uh, you know, the, the group stages uh, mm-hmm. went really well. And there's some great games. Uh, the, the opening game uh, between Australia and England uh, in Cardiff was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, there was the um, uh, the Samoans were very strong. Um, and there was the United States who put up a very good performance. Yes. Um, uh, in their group and uh, actually played Australia in the um, yes. in in the quarter final. So yeah, that that's an amazing uh, yeah yeah. If if you've been a rugby league sport for long enough, it's amazing to think that uh, the United States would be in the quarter final of a, of a rugby league World Cup. Um, so <clears throat> excuse me. And then of course they had one of the great uh, great games in the history of the World Cup, the England New Zealand semi final win. Yes. Um, Sean Johnson. Um, won the game basically with the last touch of the ball, uh, doing one of his uh, trademark yes. magic sidesteps around Kevin, England's Kevin Sinfield. Um, and then sadly, the final was um, Australia just yeah. squeezed the life out of New Zealand, and it was not really very much of a spectacle. Although, again, um, you know, massive crowd, um, uh, at the final of um, almost 75,000 people at mm-hmm. uh, Manchester United's Old Trafford ground. Uh, and I think the other thing, certainly from um, yeah, someone who went to the matches and was yep. was uh, uh, um, was, was yeah was part of the competition in a sense. Um, it just felt like a proper World Cup, like a real World Cup, like a, a soccer World Cup or a yep. rugby union World Cup. The groups, um, I mean, there was still you know slight group manipulation because there was two groups of four and two groups of three, three but yes. nevertheless, it felt like a, a, a proper World Cup. Um, and and it, and I think the it, people left that World Cup. That World Cup ended, and everybody who'd been involved, um, you know, felt optimistic mm-hmm. uh, and thoroughly and th- thoroughly enjoyed it. And it was what you would hope that a World Cup would be. Yeah. I'd say, apart from the final to some extent, but that's always, um, you know, that's always going to be, uh, um, you know, uh, 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 you know, out in in the lap of the gods. Yeah, well, you were talking there about the USA team, the Tomahawks. There, the 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 USA rugby league team. They started to get uh, well. There were stories in the New York Times and on CNN television about them, um, and they had a song. Uh, there's an Australian yeah, group yeah. there called the Wiggles uh, released a song. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. So there was all this sort of. There was a, the USA team did sort of like a, do very well. Italy also made their. Uh, World Cup debut, but again, the final was disappointing, but yes, I do myself remember seeing that semi-final, uh, which has been described as one of the best World World Cup games of all time. And Tony, in 2017... Think, so I was just going to say, one, one of the other things that I think was important yeah. about this, I think we in rugby league, um, whether we're Australians or British or whoever, basically, I think we, we sometimes underestimate the appeal of international rugby league, because I remember... Going to that final at Old Trafford, and it wasn't really a rugby league crowd. Um, there are a lot of people who clearly weren't traditional rugby league supporters, uh, but were going because this was a you know a major international tournament. And I think that you know predominantly both the British and the Australian authorities have always underestimated the power of international rugby league and the way that it can bring new audiences mm-hmm. to the game. And I think this tournament. Uh, and, and examples in in the in the past was a real demonstration of how you know how you know sometimes we're very insular and we're yeah. very, very inward looking 
Uh, this was a real example of why we don't need to be like that. How you know people they may not be rusted on rugby league supporters, but you know this is a really attractive game that people want to come and see. Yes, all right. Well, the 2017 World Cup is held in uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Papua New Guinea. It's a tournament with four groups. Uh, again, differing number of teams. Again, a fairly convoluted uh, uh, qualifying uh, system uh, through the group stage. For instance, I mean, the Irish did complain because, uh, well, they actually won two games in their group. In, they were in Group C, but they didn't qualify for the quarterfinals, whereas uh, Lebanon, who won just one game in Group A, they did get into the quarterfinals. There was this sort of thing going on. That being said, but the tournament is, again, a financial success. And... Uh, uh, Tony, also, this is a tournament, I think, when we see start to see the rise of the Pacific nations in rugby league during the course of this tournament. Yeah, uh, and much of the credit for that should go to Jason Tamalolo. Um, yes. Because, obviously, he um, he made the decision fairly, fairly close to the um, mm-hmm. World Cup deadline. Yeah. But instead of playing for New Zealand, who, who he'd represented in the past, he was going to play... Uh, for Tonga, and that led to and um, uh, Andrew Fafita followed him, and yes. other players opted for Samoa, and that really changed the the axis of the of the tournament because it meant that for the first time the you know if you want to cut the the big three Australia New Zealand and England mm-hmm. were being challenged by countries that had real uh, rugby league traditions and the players to back it up with. And I think this was a, um, this was, uh, this was probably the, uh, and people may argue with this, it, because of that, this made this tournament probably the greatest tournament uh, mm-hmm. so far in the history of the Rugby League World Cup, because, you know, there were upsets, um, you know, New Zealand got beat, mm-hmm. um, you know, Tonga came within literally Andrew, Andrew Fafita's fingernails of defeating England. In yes. the semi-final and getting to the, the World Cup. Um, uh, just an amazing tournament. The final itself was great. Uh, England and Australia yes. went toe-to-toe. Um, just one converted try separated them. Um, yeah, I think this was... Um, this was, this demonstrated the just how attractive and fantastic international rugby league can be and brought, um, you know, brought Tonga and Samoa... Tony mm-hmm. in particular, obviously because of the crowds that they brought yes. into the into the World Cup as you know fully fledged first division first class nations. I mean, Samoa didn't do particularly well, but um, nevertheless, the uh, it changed the the balance of forces within international rugby league in a way that can only be good and in a sense was long overdue. And I think hopefully we're going to see the. Uh, um, the, the fruits of that in the forthcoming World Cup. Because yes. it's important to remember, we've only ever had, um, you know, since 1954, we've only ever had three winners of the World Cup. Yes. Um, but having said that, you know, in Rugby Union, they've only ever had four. I think mm-hmm. in soccer, there's only been nine since mm-hmm. 1930. Which, um, so the fact that, you know, this tournament announced the fact that there were more than, you know, yes. we could have more than three winners uh, and yes. we would have a competitive tournament right across the groups um, was fantastically important for the game. Well, even the final itself, uh, uh, which was uh, played, there was a sellout crowd there in uh, Brisbane to see the final there. Uh, it was, as you said, there was the lowest score ever in a World Cup final. But uh, I I was expecting, because uh, England, uh, in the first half there, they did, a, well, an incredible amount of defence. Uh, I mean, it was only 6-0 at half time, but... Uh, Really, it could have been a much larger score, and I thought that would uh, uh, take its toll on the English during the second half. But no, it didn't. Uh, in, in the end, by the end of the game, it was uh, England who looked uh, more likely to score. It was sort of a very, well, a very resilient performance. Uh, I suppose I was thinking that in the second half, Australia would run away with it, but no, that didn't happen. Uh, England hung in there and. Uh, well, towards the end, they had some chances themselves to sort of like win the game, but it didn't happen. Australia do the double in 2017 World Cup. Uh, they defeat New Zealand by 23 to 16 to win the Women's World Cup. And also in 2017, we have the first wheelchair rugby league World Cup. Uh, and uh, France defeat England 
in the final of that competition. So, Tony, it brings us to the upcoming World Cup, uh, the 16th uh, Rugby League World Cup. Of course, this tournament was supposed to take place last year, but it was postponed for various uh, well, for various reasons. I, I just wonder, did postponing the tournament, did it do a lot of harm uh, to the game in Britain? Because I know that there was a lot of uh, support uh, uh, for this competition to be played uh, last year in uh, Britain. Well, at the time, uh, it, it looked like it might have caused harm. But I think in hindsight, um, the the COVID crisis was so um, intense around the world mm-hmm. that I don't think, you know, when we look back and say that it was cancelled because of COVID, uh, then the, you know, the particular circumstances of the actual cancellation are forgotten about. And, it, you know, I've, I've not come across anybody who's um, said, oh, you know, it should have been played or mm-hmm. well, yeah. no, anyway, that it should have been played or people complaining that, you know, why wasn't it played or anything like that. Um, so... As I say, at the time, it was very disappointing and very frustrating. And I think that was, uh, um, you know, that was that was the attitude of, you know, most certainly most people in the British game. But as time's moved on, um, it looks like it's going to be a really, really well-organised tournament. Mm-hmm. Um, the teams look really great. Um, and the fact that it's been organised as a, as a tournament for the men's game, the women's game and the wheelchair games gives... Gives yes. it something um, uh, that previous tournaments haven't had, but also I think in terms of world sport, um, this is the first time this has ever happened in any team yes. sport. So it's yes. a significant step forward for the game. And you know, uh, rugby league, rugby league started because it was about uh, giving people a fair chance to play the game. You know, uh, um, you know, in Australia and Britain, it was it was all about making sure that everybody could compete on a, on a level footing and nobody was disadvantaged because of the job they did or the fact they had to take time off work. Um, and that's really been rugby league's philosophy. And I think this is mm. the great thing about this tournament, that that same philosophy, those same ideas, are, are now being applied to the women's game and to the wheelchair game to, you know, uh, to, to underline yep. the fact rugby league is uh, the original equal opportunity sport. Yes, OK. And as I said a bit earlier there, There've been well, there've been 15 World Cups so far, and Australia have won 11 of uh, these competitions. Do you think that uh, Australia's dominance of this competition has perhaps well affected the credibility of the Rugby League World Cup? Yeah, I think it has to some extent because clearly, in most to- in most tournaments, you could guess the winner. Yes. Um, and and that has been a problem, and I think also the fact that. England or Great Britain before that mm-hmm. uh, have struggled to be competitive against Australia for a long time. You know, with a bit, not so much in the in the early nineteen nineties, but um, certainly since then, I think that has uh, that has damaged in the international game um, and its credibility. Having said that, I think now the changes that took place at, in two thousand seventeen with the you know, the um, players opting to play for Pacific Island nations and you yes. know, hopefully other nations as well at some point. Um, that brings the credibility back. And certainly in 2017, there was the potential, you know, there, there, there were massive upsets with the rise of Tonga and you know, potential mm-hmm. even bigger upsets. And I think in any sports tournament, you've got to have a level of uncertainty. Yes. Uh, you know, it, you don't want to go to a game knowing who is definitely going to win. Um Certainly, on a long-term basis, that you know, that's it's difficult to sustain interest if you you know you go and you know Australia yeah. are simply going to win, and I think that's going to change, and I think that you know we may see that at this World Cup. We've now got what five, probably six, very strong teams: Australia, New Zealand, mm-hmm. England, Samoa, Tonga, Fiji, to some extent. So the potential for upsets, uh, you know, who knows? Australia might go out with the quarterfinals, which. And, you know, I mean, I'm a massive admirer of Australian rugby league, but I think if that happened, that would be one of the best things that could yes. ever happen to the international game. Yes. Um, obviously, you know, as, uh, as somebody in England, I think it'd be great for the game if England won. But, you know, the message that a final that had Samoa or Tonga in it, uh, that that would send out to the sports world and to sports fans. Um, yes. This, you know, this would send out a message that rugby league is, a, is a, you know, it's a different type of game. There's something exciting and different going on in rugby league. And I think this, you know, this is what this tournament can uh, c- can offer. All right. 
So what would you say? What would you say the Rugby League World Cup has done for the game overall, Tony? What what's uh, the Rugby League World Cup done for the game of rugby league overall? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think that it's not always managed it, but yes. it's managed to focus attention sometimes on the importance of international sport. And it's by having a World Cup, it it's meant that rugby league has had to look at what other sports are doing in their World Cups. And that's mm-hmm. always a good thing because I think, as I said before, one of the problems we've got as a sport, whether it's in Australia or France or England, wherever, we're actually a very inward and insular looking, insular looking sport. Uh, you know, we don't, you know, we're very focused on our own little world. And sometimes it does you a lot of good to look out there and see what other people are doing. And having a World Cup means that we have to respond to what other World Cups are doing. And I think without the World Cup, then, you know, it's, you know, International Rugby League would be in a very, very poor state. Mm. Uh, as we Well, as we can see, that's what's happened over the last, uh, you know, three or four years when almost no internationals have been played. Yes. So the World Cup is an absolutely essential part of the game. And I think um, going forward, looking into the future, it's it's a great platform for us to take, you know, the, the message of Rugby League out to the wider world and see more and more people and more and more countries playing, you know, the greatest game of all. That's the way it was, the history of the Rugby League World Cup. My name's Rob Corra. On behalf of Tony Collins, this program was recorded in the studios of Undercover Music. Your producer is Adriano Eldemar. Until next time, may the force be with you. Gearing up for the action, the feeling still the same. You've got butterflies in the stomach. The mind is on the game Play this game of rugby league Some folks would think you're nuts But it takes a lot of skill And just plain old-fashioned guts So whether you're on the cricket ground Lang Park or the bush You've still got to run You've still got to tackle And the scrums have got the same push You give it some, you give some more And you really give Playing rugby league football, it's the greatest game of all. Oh, there's nothing like the spectacle of a test match in full roar. With the forwards charging, backs are stepping, running at full ball. The Pommies and the Kiwis and the Frogs all play real keen. But we take on all comers and Australia reigns supreme. So whether you're on the cricket ground, Lang Park, you still gotta run, you still gotta tackle, and the scrums have got the same push. You give it some, you give some more, and you really give your all. Playing rugby league football, it's the greatest game of all. Oracle play it, just sort of a quarter way, places the lang, across field of beast, and after beast, and turns it back to lang. Lang gives it back now to Maninka, standing still. Maninka gives it back to close, who has to reverse and go back in field. Quick throws it away! He's up the center, can he get him in the car? He's in! Some more.